सर्वे भवन्तु सुखिन सर्वे संतु निरामय ट्रू वेल्थ ऑफ होलिस्टिक हेल्थ एंड हैप्पीनेस फॉर ऑल ट्रू वेल्थ इंटीग्रेटिव हेल्थ सेंटर्स वर एस्टैब्लिश्ड टू बी मिशन टू रिवर्स कंट्रोल एंड प्रिवेंट डिजीजेस एंड ऑगमेंट हेल्थ बाय इंटीग्रेटिंग ऑल अप्रोप्रिएट scientific evidence based personalized nutrition and fitness therapies functional medicine and advanced surgical yeah, treatments with a holistic wellness approach this coincides with prime minister narendra modi's vision of the flagship ayushman bharat health and wellness centers initiative integrative healthcare does not mean a alternative medicine at true health eminent doctors surgeons personalized nutrition and fitness experts focus on the patient as a whole person to identify and address the root causes and bring about true relief from diseases by combining ancient wisdom with modern science and bringing about a deep collaboration among health practitioners from multiple disciplines to create a comprehensive health ecosystem to help patients meet all their health needs physical emotional and social i rajeshri gadgil celebrity nutrition expert and founder and ceo of true wealth integrative health centers um, i take a proud privilege to welcome you all to this special session on geriatric care and who else but more proud to have renowned doctors from our very favorite destination goa sharing their knowledge and experience in understanding elderly health issues their treatments preventions complications and more um, a quick introduction about me i have about 20 years of global experience in healthcare and nutrition in various therapy areas i have done my masters from the sign hospital in mumbai and an mba in marketing and have fortunately been able to help a lot of patients reverse control and prevent uh, ailments such as arthritis osteoporosis metabolic syndrome um, and many more such uh, i am happy to have conducted and anchored more than 400 plus patient programs and initiatives uh, with more than 1000 global health and nutrition experts on a uh, true wealth integrated health tv platform and we have reached probably reached to more, more than 2 million viewers and we continue to do so so uh, i won't take more time introducing myself but actually uh introducing today's speakers here and I'll request all of them to uh put their videos on so that um, the audience can uh, see them well i will uh first give the uh, introduction of all of them and to begin with of course our uh, favorite i would say dr rokino montero and uh, rightly so he's uh, just lately of course been the uh president of the IMA Goa state 2022 uh, he is of course a very uh, experienced consultant physician cardio diabetologist um, uh he's done his md internal medicine pg diploma in cardiology pg diploma in advanced diabetes care from rcp uk uh he's ex assistant professor of medicine uh, at the goa medical college currently of course practicing at his own clinic uh, montero clinic at punjab goa and he is also attached to various hospitals including um, manipal hospital dona paula uh, and uh, the new vrindavan hospital and trinity hospital mirabai um, he was a, pro- a course trainer at the national diabetes educator program in goa from 2014 to, to, to 2018 and um, the course faculty for goa state for public health foundation of india ccpdm that is the certificate course in evidence based diabetes management uh, this is just a short profile of the of his i mean i can go on and on uh, knowing the number of patients he has treated and uh, so many happy patients that he has been managing for so many years uh, dr rupino montero welcome uh, to our show uh, your first one but you're of course uh, not uh very not at all new to us uh, we you. also have uh, uh dr mahendra kurchankar here um so if you could uh, switch on your video also i uh, dr mahendra kurchankar has of course been on our channel earlier and uh, helped us understand uh, various uh, orthopedic fitness needs and 
how they can be fulfilled as well as diabetic food which is he, which he's very passionate about and um, he's of course going to talk about it as well today um, he's the chief of orthopedic surgery health Bay group of hospitals mbbs from gmc uh, ms uh, dnb he's a member of college of surgeons of edinburgh uk 2005 the fellow of international college of surgeons 2009 president of indian foot and ankle society just off late in 2021 uh, he is joint replacement he's done a training in joint replacement surgery at lutheran general hospital in chicago usa um, he has of course done the basic uh, and advanced aotroma course and he's also a faculty there um, arthroscopy fellow at the Vero Hospital in UK, spinal fellow with uh, Dr. P.S. Romani at Mumbai, shoulder and elbow replacement surgery training at Bangkok, revision joint replacement surgery training at China. And he doesn't stop there. He is presently pursuing his PhD in stem cell research. Uh, he's national faculty for uh, AO trauma courses, as, as I said, and He's sports medicine expert of the Goa Government Health Panel, advisor to the Sports Authority of Goa and Health Clubs. And of course, uh, not to mention that he's the national ATLS instructor as well. So uh, Dr. Mahendra Kutsarkar, welcome to our show. Um, apart from that, of course, uh, two more important faculty that we have today uh, is Dr. Amol Mahaldar. Dr. Amol Mahaldar is a um, he's an alumnus of Goa Medical College. He's completed his MBBS and MD medicine in 2004. He pursued his DNB in nephrology in uh, Minakshi Mission Hospital and Research Center. And uh, uh, he's also, of course, the ISPD scholar, that is the International Society of Peritoneal Dialysis um, Scholar. And he's underwent the fellowship training at Sanjay Gandhi. Postgraduate Institute of Medical Sciences, Lucknow. He has been instrumental in setting up the first kidney transplant unit at the GMC in 2011. Presently, he is working with leading hospitals in Goa, including the prestigious Manipal Hospital Goa. Um, Dr. Mahaldar has a passion for preventive nephrology and clinical research, and which is really going to uh, help us, you know, in a way that our audience will get more knowledge about preventive nephrology and Dr. Mahaldar has a over a dozen publications in journals of repute and has presented several awards winning research papers in national and international conferences. Dr. Mahaldar is among very among the very few Indian doctors to complete a postgraduate diploma in transplant procurement and management at the University of Barcelona in 2017. He's currently the coordinator for the organ donation cell of the IMA Goa State and is actively pursuing the establishment of a disease donor kidney transplant program in Goa. So Dr. Amol Mahaldar, welcome to our show as well. Um, and last but not the least, oncology, which is, which, is a, uh, which is a very, very difficult issue today. We have Dr. Gunjan Vaijal here. Uh, he's consultant radiation oncologist at the Manipal Hospital in Goa. He's trained at premier hospitals like AMC Manipal and the Tata Memorial Hospital in Mumbai, trained for duration for short duration in CBRT at Wake Forest University in North Carolina, USA. 12 good years of experience in high, high end radiation techniques. Uh, he has to his credit more than 20 national and international publications, among which his publication on guidelines for lo local regional treatment of breast cancer stand out, stands out. He has contributed to the development of evidence-based guidelines for management of head and neck cancers in India. He's published one of the largest series in the world on early vocal cord cancers. Um, he has won prestigious awards like in the Indian College of Radiation Oncology Award for management of breast cancers and the Sam Mystery Travel Grant for presenting his research paper at the American Society of Radiation Oncology Meeting. One of the first consultants to work at the uh, first True Beam Center of India in Ahmedabad, and he has set for, he has set up and led a team of oncology professionals at the three IMRT and IGRT capable centers in India. So, Dr. Gunjan Bajal, welcome to our show as well. Um, 
right with that i think i am uh, going to of course request um, uh, dr rufino montero uh, to help us you know cardiac disease as we uh, all know is the primary cause world over and uh, of course uh, grave issue in india as well uh, however having said said that most of us go to goa so that we can uh, we can drop our stress out there uh, but uh, i'm sure um, uh, out of his experience is going to help us learn different aspects of heart health diabetes and all these uh, different uh, metabolic syndrome complications that arise out of, out of that and how the elderly can really um, you know prevent such kind of diseases and as well as when they suffer from it how can they keep their quality of life and uh, avoid further complications um, so really um, sir over to you uh, it's such a proud privilege to to hear you here uh, on our show thank you very much <laughs> rajeshri yes it's a proud privilege for me to be here at this meeting and i fondly remember your father my great friend late mr r s gadgil while paying homage to him i think that what you are doing is a definite homage for what he was doing he was always interested in enriching the knowledge of doctors and of people and i think with this true well tv you are doing exactly that he will be blessing you and blessing us from above you can see my slides yes okay i start with as the opening batsman for today's session where i will be talking of heart health and diabetes in the geriatric population for me this topic of geriatrics has been very very uh, a passionate one because even when i was the president of the goa state ima last year our team was on geriatrics taking care of the old with a heart of gold so why because today we know that in the geriatric population the world over the geriatric population is increasing by leaps and bounds yeah. and just as we have in india the largest population of the young as they say we will shortly be having also the largest population of the elderly very shortly we know that currently as per the conditions prevailing people expect to live into their 60s and maybe 70s but as the world is experiencing growth growth both in size of the population growth in the various uh medical science and medical fields the proportion of older patients in the population is also growing by 2030 one in six people in the world will be aged 60 years or over at this time the share of the population aged 60 years and over will increase from 1 billion in 2020 to 1.4 billion and by 2050 the world's population of people aged 60 years and older will double to 2.1 billion the number of persons aged 80 years or older is expected to triple between 2020 and 2050 and to reach the 426 million mark so you can see how fast the elderly population is uh, increasing and why we have to focus on geriatrics from now on what are the common health conditions associated with aging we know that we have lots of problems as age occurs it is really ironic that everybody wants to live long and we want our elders to continue living 
but in older age there are lots of medical problems that occur including hearing loss cataracts refractive errors pains in the back in the neck osteoarthritis chronic obstructive pulmonary disease diabetes heart disease stroke depression dementia and we can go on and on as people age they are more likely to experience even several conditions at the same time lucky are those who have no ailments no comorbidities and we see quite a few of them older age is also characterized by the emergence of several complex health, health states commonly called geriatric syndromes they are often the consequence of multiple underlying factors and include frailty urinary incontinence falls delirium pressure ulcers and the consequences of all these coming to diabetes mellitus and coronary heart disease these are heavily entwined clinical conditions particularly in the elderly the coronary heart disease is the most common clinical manifestation of atherosclerosis related to diabetes and the preponderant majority of deaths in diabetic patients are attributable to coronary heart disease diabetes affects about 1/5 people over the age of 65 and most of these have type 2 diabetes elderly diabetic patients as we all know have big exposure to a high risk of cardiovascular complications including peripheral vascular disease which can ultimately result in gangrene and amputations heart disease usually ischemic heart disease heart failure and cerebral strokes and many geriatric syndromes from cognitive impairment to urinary incontinence as i have just mentioned the older adults with diabetes are at a high risk for common geriatric syndrome that include cognitive impairment depression urinary incontinence mobility impairment falls which are a great cause for the elderly to get fractures especially of the hip and persistent pain in various places especially in the back and in the neck cognitive function should be assessed routinely in older adults with diabetes to give them treatment before they go into a total dementia it is important to manage diabetes because over time it can cause serious health problems like i have mentioned heart disease and stroke kidney disease eye problems and nerve damage that may even lead to amputation also people with type 2 diabetes may be at a greater risk for cancer and alzheimers disease caring for patients over age 80 requires an individualized rather than a guideline driven approach we cannot many at times go all out in this elderly patients like we would have gone in for those at a younger age in many older patients the risks of overtreating diabetes outweigh the benefits the american geriatric society recommends a goal of hba1c of 7.5 to 8% in these older patients with moderate comorbidities and life expectancy less than 10 years the american diabetes association recommends a more relaxed goal of 8 to 8.5% for older patients with complex medical issues these recommendations are supported by evidence that low hba1c targets did not reduce the risk of macrovascular complications but rather if you had tighter control they would go into hypoglycemia which could cause immense damage to them either in the brain they could have falls and develop fractures they could have even cardiac problems because they go into a severe hypoglycemia the difference in the the different systems 
in the body that serve us and mind they undergo alterations during the aging process and are unavoidable part of the life this process starts according to some researchers with birth and accelerates with advancing age leading to changes that are sometimes obvious but frequently go unnoticed for a long time one of the most widely discussed investigated diagnosed and treated processes is atherosclerosis which leads to unmistakable damage to our cardiovascular system with age the function of the heart is influenced mainly by the decrease in elasticity and the ability to respond to changes in pressure of the arterial system the resultant increase in the resistance to the pumping action of the heart thereby increases the work needed to drive the blood to the various organs of the body the atherosclerotic process results in thickening of the arterial wall and this is relatively easily measured in our neck the carotid arteries by the carotid doppler the presence of such a thickening may itself be a sign of preclinical disease and may even predict future cardiovascular disorders ensuing stiffening of the arteries leads to high blood pressure and in the elderly especially the upper pressure increases what we call is as the systolic hypertension the lower diastolic blood pressure may decrease and the difference between the two which is called the pulse pressure increases this effect is an independent risk factor for developing cardiovascular disorders this systolic hypertension is difficult to treat and only recently have there been indications that certain types of therapy that target the thickening of the arterial walls rather than aiming at lowering the pressure itself can be helpful among the drugs used to remodel the arterial wall we find some old remedies as well as newly discovered agents in the times gone by in fact when we were even young medical students and graduates it was the tendency not to treat the systolic hypertension as it was a normal finding in the elderly but now we have come to realize the importance of treating systolic hypertension because it can be a forerunner to lot of cardiovascular uh, problems that the elderly face the aforementioned increased load on the heart leads to an increase in the mass of the heart what we call as the cardiac hypertrophy usually the left ventricular hypertrophy and to the formation of scar tissue in the heart muscle thereby leading to impairment of the vital relaxation of the heartbeat if the scarring affects the tiny organ of the heart the sinus node that guards the regularity of the heart and or the other minuscule node the atrioventricular or av node that is essential for the propagation of the electric impulse to the ventricles major and sometimes fatal disturbances in the heart rate and rhythm may occur which would necessitate a pacemaker implantation elderly patients those over the age of 70 should not neglect symptoms such as shortness of breath which was not there earlier progressive fatigue heart beats that are too fast too slow or irregular pain or discomfort in the left chest or dizziness because all of the symptoms may be a consequence of age alone may not be a consequence of age alone but could signify a recently acquired heart condition because paradoxically angina pectoris without pain also no becomes more frequent in older age and is manifest with such symptoms as mentioned above so elderly patients should not wait only for the 
occurrence of uh, heart chest pain formation of calcium crystals which we call as calcification which may be looked on as an extreme degree of fibrosis involving the mainly the heart valves especially the aortic valve causing aortic stenosis and this situation can begin in people in their 50s and sometimes called as senile atherotic stenosis also or atherosclerotic aortic stenosis other cardiac valves may be involved as well but the frequency of the involvement is far less the calcification if detected in the coronary arteries may be a sign of atherosclerosis even in asymptomatic individuals hence people age 65 and older are much more likely than younger people to suffer a heart attack to have a stroke or to develop coronary artery disease heart disease and heart failure coronary artery disease of these people who die because of cad above 80% belong to the 65 plus population as mentioned earlier angina pectoris without pain silent ischemia becomes more frequent in the elderly and symptoms like fatigue or exertional dyspnea should not be overlooked either because older people live a more sedentary life with less walking high blood pressure is a risk factor for coronary heart disease myocardial infarction and stroke and is very common in older adults it is a leading cause of preventable illness and death controlling high blood pressure is shown to reduce the risk of fatal myocardial infarctions and strokes so what is a normal blood pressure for a senior citizen many at times we find that the elderly or those who accompany them say no no doctor the blood pressure 160 is normal because he is old or i am old but it is not so recently the american heart association updated their guidance to indicate that people age 65 and older should ideally have a blood pressure reading lower than 130 by 80 mm of mercury advice given to a young person aimed at prevention of atherosclerotic heart disease or its progression is valid for the elderly as well older aging although aging itself is an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease it is still advocated irrespective of age to avoid smoking promote physical activity control blood pressure careful hypoglycemic therapy in diabetics prevention of obesity and all other measures that promote cardiac health surprisingly statin therapy to reduce cholesterol has been shown to reduce mortality even if started over the age of 80 years and in these individuals lipid levels similar to those in younger patients are targeted so we see that there is no let up in the treatment but we should not be very harsh in maintaining low levels of blood sugar but when it comes to blood pressure we should be able to maintain the level of 130 by 80 even in an old individual thank you for your patient listening well that was a uh, uh, lot of input for us to actually keep in mind and i, I believe each uh, slide of yours or you know each aspect that you cover itself uh, is going to be an extensive uh, presentation and talk uh, and you know we are going to uh, take your help so that uh, uh, more of the audience can actually um, understand uh, more about uh, these uh, diseases and the treatments in depth so uh, uh, 
Dr. Uh, Rufino Montero. It was it was a pleasure to get all these inputs from you, and I'm sure we'll have some questions for you towards. Yeah, the yeah. Question and answer will be good. You gave me a very short time, but a very large field. So I yes. just did what I could in the small little yes. time. Thank you very much. So I I guess we we will have to have more uh, deeper presentations with you. Uh, and I'm ho hoping we can do that soon as well. Uh, with that, I think uh, we have our I next know. speaker really lined up and uh, mm. uh, we have lots to be covered. So we have Dr. Uh, Mahindra Kutsatkar here. Uh, he's, as we know, uh, a leading uh, orthopedic surgeon and uh, uh, he heads orthopedics uh, at one of the leading hospitals in Goa, but uh, he has a he has lot of passion, especially for the diabetic board uh, an area which is quite neglected um, by the patients. Uh, also, less amount of work has been done on it countrywide. So it's really a pleasure to have him here because uh, he has done extensive integrative programs on this for doctors, patients, and uh, uh, Dr. Kurtzakar, uh, over to you really. I mean, we want to uh, hear your inputs and we are, uh, we'll, of course, share your uh, slides here so that... Uh, the audience can understand better. Sure, thank you. Right. <clears throat> thank you, Rajeshri, uh, for that uh, introduction. So without further ado, I, I as soon as I finish uh, one presentation, I'll just say next, so then you can just click it on because I'm not in control of the slides. So we all know what the diabetic foot ulcer is, but just for the sake of definition, we know that it's an ulcer which doesn't heal in the normal healing time. And 15% uh, of the people with diabetes will develop a diabetic foot ulcer in their lifetime. Almost 10 patients uh, would undergo an amputation every hour. And this is the US figures. But you know, if you interpolate it with the go on, uh, for the Indian scenario, it will be much higher. 50% of all those diabetic foot ulcers will get infected and will eventually, 24% will have wounds and will result in an amputation. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah. So how big is the problem? I mean, I think uh, the problem is uh, huge. It's not just big. It's really extensive because diabetes itself is the, you know, it's one of the uh, biggest problems in uh, a developing country like India. And diabetes is, uh, you know, India is the diabetes capital of India, the world. And diabetic foot ulcer is like, uh, you know, like an end stage disease, just like the, the kidney fails and eventually land up with dialysis or the patient gets a heart attack and patient lands up in the hospital. Similarly, a diabetic foot ulcer is like a failure of treatment of what has been happening in the body. 35% of all hospital admissions in diabetic clinics are because of diabetic foot ulcers. 80% of non-traumatic amputations of the lower limb are because of diabetic foot ulcers a staggering economic impact of not only on the individual, the family, but the whole society and the country. $3,000 to one like $80,000 is the expense of an average patient getting treated for diabetic foot ulcers. Next slide, please. So what are the issues? See, the problem in India is that diabetic foot care has been an ignored problem. There are various reasons for that, and we cannot go into the details for why this has happened. But somehow it has not, the diabetic foot ulcer patient doesn't land up with the right uh, uh, clinic in, with the right uh, ability to treat the patient as a whole. So what we require is a multidisciplinary team approach for treating a diabetic foot ulcers. Due to social, religious and economic compulsions, people walk barefoot in India. And one of the reasons why that small ulcer develops into a big wound is the term we use in diabetic foot ulcer is called as loss of protective sensation. Now, loss of protective sensation happens much, much earlier in terms of a decade or more before the foot ulcer happens. And here is the key, is that we have to improve the awareness of this problem, not just among the patients, not just among the society, but in the minds of the treating physicians themselves. Because so many patients with diabetes would visit your clinic for a problem unrelated to your branch. But it is mandatory for us to understand that we do a detailed evaluation of this patient so that we can find out who are the ones at the risk of this disease. Next slide, please. The 
prevalence of infection in the diabetic for ulcer is 6 to 11 percent. Prevalence of amputation is 3 percent in all type 2 diabetes patients. Neuropathy, 15 percent. But this figure is much, much lower than what the actual story is. Up to 85% of all diabetic foot related problems are preventable. Now here, this is the key that if we can prevent 85% of the problem, just imagine the impact that we can have on society in terms of the morbidity that these patients are going to go through. Incidence of diabetic foot also was 9% and 39.8% if they were ones who practice foot care and those who did not practice foot care. A simple educating program on the patients has such a huge impact on the outcome of the diabetic foot ulcer. Next slide, please. So many amputations. I mean, amputation is a failure. Basically, amputation is a failure of treatment. Just like if somebody gets a, a disc prolapse, it's basically a failure of treatment because when the patient was having a back pain, he was not being treated. Similarly, there are so many telltale signs that there is an ulcer, there is loss of protective sensation, there is a poor blood supply. This patient should be treated during that time, not when the patient has already developed a gangrene and an infection. 45,000 legs are lost every year. Almost 75% of these amputations are carried out in the neuropathic fit. So these are the ones which have loss of protective sensation. Diabetes is one of the major causes. Uh, hello. Again. Lack of uh, medical care and insufficient knowledge is, are the barriers that help these things to progress. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So only 45.7% patients have, had not received previous foot care education. 0.6% walked barefoot outdoors and 45% walked barefoot indoors. Now, why am I mentioning this is because every diabetes patient has to be advised that they have to wear a chappal or a shoe, whether they're indoors or outdoors, because this will reduce the risk of they getting an ulcer. And all of these patients, if they give a previous history of ulceration, then the risk of getting a new ulcer doubles up. So all these things have to be understood. Patients' education on foot care, also on the use of tobacco, because this is going to multiply the problems in the ischemic ulcer. Next slide, please. So what are the perils of diabetic foot ulcers? There was a study done in an Indian center, 1,985 patients, type 2 diabetic. 90% of those occurrence of them were due to infection. And those patients who under, underwent in, uh, amputation after a ulcer was because of infection. And infection is a controllable factor. Major amputations accounting for 30 to 50 percent are below the knee and 11.9 percent were above the knee amputations. Usually the above knee amputations are usually in the ischemic group where there is a very, very poor blood supply. Minor amputations in 70 percent or more. So, so many people lose their toes over a period of time. Prevalence of neuropathy was 82 percent. That is the incidence of neuropathy in our Indian population. 35% had, so one third of the patients almost have an ischemic component and remaining have a neuropathic component. Next slide. Generally, you know, this is how the patient ends up. And this situation, we do not want to happen. So this can be easily prevented by educating the patients, educating the society, and educating our own physicians so that they can advise and they can you know, focus on preventive aspects so that these patients eventually will never end up with a diabetic foot ulcer. Next slide. And the three <clears throat> uh, reasons why a diabetic foot ulcer, as we all know, ischemia is just 30% of the time. The predominant factor is the neuropathy, which just not affects the sensory component, but also the motor component. And finally, when these two things, that is the loss of protective sensations and the ischemic components, they act together and create an ulcer. The third thing that sets up in is the infection. The fourth thing that is also important in a diabetic situation is the immunopathy. That is that the poor immune response. So even if there is an ulcer, if the body's ability to heal the ulcer is normal, 
if there is a normal neutrophilic uh, you know activation and uh, proper and uh, pathways are stimulated then the wound will heal but the problem in diabetes is that there are multiple pathways like the polyol pathway the hexosamine pathway the protein kinase c pathway all these pathways are activated because of multiple ros production in the mitochondria now, this is the primary reason why all the problems in diabetes occur in different organs and foot ulcer is not different next slide please now it is very important that when the patient comes to our clinic we need to stratify the risks that who are these patients in this diabetes whom we have to be extra careful if they have a loss of protective sensation that is by doing the monofilament test or they have a rhombox positive or you can see that they have certain deformities now this intrinsic minus foot that we will see multiple almost every second or third patient with diabetes will have this intrinsic minus foot but nobody even watches the foot because the patient has come for a diabetes you will do his sugar level get his blood pressure checked maybe get an ecg because physicians are more focused on looking at the cardiac part of it but nobody really watches the foot so i feel that from tomorrow if every physician whether it is a medical side or whether it is surgeon or anybody who treats diabetic complications must have one look at the foot and if you can see on the slide if the normal foot how it looks and the right on the is the intrinsic minus foot that intrinsic minus foot has got so much pressure points that the risk of getting an ulcer is very very high then comes the peripheral arterial disease you can do a doppler test you can look at the abi poor glycemic control is also a risk factor patient has pre ulcer lesions like corns callosities and peronychia now these are not small things in a diabetic patient these are really the like a time bomb ticking history of previous ulcer long standing diabetes ill fitting shoes a simple thing like a ill fitting shoe is a very very high risk factor for a diabetic foot ulcer and chronic renal insufficiency which i think dr amol will speak later on next slide please so these are some of the uh, pre risk uh, you know pre ulcer lesions that you can see which which has to ring a bell in your head that this patient will very soon land up with a diabetic foot ulcer and it is our you know it is our uh, responsibility to guide the patient on this next slide please these are the pressure point areas that you have to look for in every intrinsic minus foot next slide these are the type of lesions that you will see in your clinic because if you don't treat these lesions they will definitely land up with a bigger deeper ulcer and land up with infection next slide please now you see on the left side you will see these three areas initially it starts like a hot spot a little warmness a little redness now here is where you have to be very careful because this is the beginning of the ulcer happening and ulcers start breaking down from inside initially the skin will be intact on the outside and one of the worst thing is the patient will never never complain about it he has to be educated in looking at his feet every day and treating it like his hand any calluses have to be trimmed and the reason why a callus occurs is because there is an abnormal pressure point just shaving it off is not going to help and eventually these calluses will break down and form an ulcer and we have to look out for the deformities because the deformity creates those pressure points next slide so discolored skin foul odor ulcer that lasts longer than 2 weeks ulcer bigger than 2 cm ulcer that does not quickly heal or begin to heal is the one which we have to be worried about next slide please next slide so clinical no no go just go back clinical evaluation of uh, the diabetic foot ulcer we have to first do a visual inspection look at the depth assessment of the ulcer look at the vascularity the skin temperature watch the gait of the patient also you have to look at the shoes because shoes are the major culprit that are at risk look at those deformities of the intrinsic minus foot and a detailed neurological examination next slide please now this sort of ulcers they look so deadly but mind you this ulcers will eventually land up with an amputation but as deadly as they look let me tell you that since the time i've started treating diabetic foot ulcers 
I can heal these ulcers in six weeks' time. People have the healthy ulcers for months and years together. Daily dressing, you know, they just the wound just doesn't heal simply because the load on that ulcer has not been taken off. Next slide, please. So when you look at the wound, you have to look at the extent and the depth of the wound. Look for the presence of ischemia because ischemia will have to be addressed if the ulcer has to be healed. And that would be relevant in one third of the situation. And look for the presence of infection because till you don't control infection, that ulcer again is not going to heal. So how do you all do all these three things? Is by assessing the depth of the ulcer, by doing a culture, and by looking at the blood flow by doing an ABI or maybe by doing a vascular Doppler. Next slide. So in the principles of treatment of DFU, that is a diabetic foot ulcer, offloading of the ulcer is extremely important. Now, what do we mean by this term offloading? In this entire presentation, if you remember this, just this one word, offloading, I think you will have understood what how to treat a diabetic foot ulcer. Offloading simply means you remove the pressure on the ulcer. This can be done by using an orthotic, just by giving a patient a walking stick, by using a crutch, or by using a wheelchair, or by doing certain offloading surgeries. So the skill of the orthopedic surgeon lies in detecting which are the pressure points and how do we offload them. And this can be done by multiple surgeries like doing a tendinotomy, a tendon release, by doing an osteotomy. And this is where the trick is. Ulcer management is standard. You just do a wet dressing, maintain moisture of the uh, ulcer. Infection control is important. Improving the blood flow. If the patient has a block, these patients can undergo angiography, angioplasty, and improve the blood flow. Correction of deformity. Correction of deformity is probably the most important thing in the entire treatment of a diabetic foot ulcer. Optimizing the levels of glucose, lipids, and blood pressure are also important. Controlling the comorbidities and to stop smoking. Next slide. We have to have a multidisciplinary approach. We cannot treat a diabetic foot ulcer alone because these patients have multiple problems. I mean, just an orthopedic surgeon treating a diabetic foot ulcer and paying no attention to the glycemic levels, paying no attention to his uh, comorbidities, paying no attention to his uh, personal habits will not achieve anything. So we have this list where every person is important depending on the Assessment. So initially, the patient has to be assessed, depending on whether the patient has a neuropathic ulcer, a vascular ulcer, or a patient has got other comorbidities. Every branch has to be involved in treating this patient. Next slide. So as I said, offloading can occur using different types of orthotics like a total contact cast, a cam walker, a crow splint. And once we have offloaded these ulcers, Suppose there is a situation where the patient has a fixed deformities, we can resort to surgical methods to release the pressure on that ulcer. You have to remove, uh, you know, sometimes you have to put a total contact cast, which is removable, especially in ischemic ulcers or those ulcers which have a lot of exudative types of ulcers. We can use different types of ankle high offloaders for non-plantar ulcers. Next slide. This is a slide which shows the number of amount of stress that is occurring under the metatarsal head, a compression force, a shear force. Now, under normal circumstances, any excessive force will result in pain. But unfortunately, in the diabetic foot ulcers, these patients do not have the privilege of pain. So the pain being not being there, these abnormal stresses keep on occurring, creating an ulcer. First, there is a con, first a pressure point, followed by a con then the skin breaks down, then there is an ulcer. The ulcer gets infected. Infection creates ischemia. Infection will lead to gangrene. And finally, it will lead to an amputation. Next slide. This is a, uh, what we call as a pedobarograph or a foot scan, which I have in my hospital. And we, we can actually pinpoint where the pressure points are and advise what sort of an orthotics these patients need, what sort of a surgery these patients need. And this is how we are able to achieve results much, much earlier and much more quicker because the focus is on treating these pressure points. Next slide. This is another slide which shows how 
just using certain felted foams and changing the contour of the total contact cast can redistribute the forces on the larger area and allow the healing of the ulcer. Next slide. The first picture is of a total contact cast, then you have a cam walker, then you have this special type of offloading devices where if the ulcer is on the forefoot, you can have a, a shoe with, where you can walk just on the heel. Next slide. Next slide. Just removing the callus, though it is not the complete treatment, it does allow reducing the plantar pressure by about 29%. So if the patient has a callus, this patient has to undergo a trimming of the callus. But that's not his final treatment. But at least it will allow that this patient will not get an ulcer quickly. Next slide. In the shoe, we need to advise patients that they have to have shoes which are broad toe box because if they get squeezed inside, then there'll be a pressure point on the toes, a soft insole, a rigid outsole because a rigid outsole will protect the midfoot strains on the foot. A foot, a shoe with an extra depth so that it accommodates those intrinsic minus foot deformities and a non-traumatic lining. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah. So how uh, frequent have the ulcers to be evolved? That is to be done every week. And what do we look for? We look for the depth of the wound because the deeper the wound, more chances of osteomyelitis, degree of exudation, presence of infection, and degree of ischemia. These are the four things that you need to look in any diabetic foot ulcer. Next slide. If it is a superficial ulcer, just debride the, you know, to a bleeding margin and just use a moist saline dressing. That's all that is required. You may use empirical oral uh, broad spectrum antibiotics, but the moment the ulcer becomes deeper and then you have dead tendon tissue, then draining the, removing the dead tissue, going down deeper and releasing the pockets of pus are very, very important. Hydrocolloid and alginate dressings are required for more of exudative wounds. Parental antibiotics may be required in presence of active infection. And we have to resort to revascularization procedures because if you do not revascularize the, the leg, the ulcer down, which is ischemic, will never heal, no matter how much of the best world's best dressing is used on the wound. Next slide. So this is how you probe the ulcer and look at the depth. Next slide. Next slide. Now, in addition to the various high-end dressings that are available, which are very costly and really have no major role to play except in very, very difficult wounds. As I said, a normal saline dressing which keeps the wound moist is good enough. But sometimes maybe you have to re uh, resort to platelet-derived growth factors in a poorly healing ulcer where there is no granulation tissue occurring. Sometimes you have to use a collagenase enzyme to debride a chronic necrotic ulcer. VAC dressings, I mean, in fact, this is one of my um, armamentarium for a big non-healing ulcer, which is very deep and big one. The negative pressure uh, vacuum-assisted closure, which is called as, this is something that helps to reduce the size of the wound and shrink the wound much faster. You can also use ESWT for a non-responding ulcer, that is extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. Sometimes you can use hyperbaric oxygen for very ischemic ulcers, but these are in the rare cases. Next slide. Control of infection is extremely important. As I said, you may start initially with a broad spectrum, but if you do a routine, do a culture and use the specific antibiotics, your outcomes are going to be better. Next slide. Improve the tissue perfusion. And how do you do that? First, you have to do the ABI, assess and look how much ischemia is there. You may do a transcutaneous PO2 assessment. You may also do an angiography to understand where there is a block and then resort to angioplasty to open up the uh, vascularity. Next slide. So what are the special procedures? As I said, for in, this, in the hands of an orthopedic surgeon, corrective osteotomies, resection of metatarsal heads, revascularization of those ulcers, skin graftings, using skin substitutes, all this work in combination. Next slide. Next slide. Now, this is uh, uh, the previous slide was showing you a Charcot's foot. So this is a midfoot ulcer in a Charcot's patient, not healing for 
you know almost 3 months before coming to me next slide and gradually after one week of excising the bone that was protruding into the ulcer and just silver colloid dressing next slide the wound is already beginning to heal two weeks post op next slide three weeks next slide and this is what i used you see that boot on the left is a crow splint with an insole this went into a absolute normal healing in a total of 6 weeks time next slide this is how they healed next slide and here is really there is no magic the magic lies in identifying what is it that is not allowing the ulcer to heal most important is loss of protective sensation second is the abnormal pressure points that is created there and increase improving the the environment for the ulcer to heal that is by keeping it moist and removing the infection so four essentials of preventing dfu first is patient education on foot skin and toenail care using the correct protective footwear and to do the protective surgeries so that eventually they do not have to land up with major amputations next slide next slide so the best tools of prevention screening and referral to a foot care clinic if high risk fixtures are present wearing therapeutic footwear and increasing patient education for prevention next slide yeah i think that's my last slide uh, thank you very much uh, rajeshri for this opportunity i think we have a long way to go and we must continue in uh, educating ourselves our patients our society and only then we will be able to achieve something positive uh, in managing these diabetic foot ulcers and improving the quality of life of these patients thank you very much well all of us uh, here on this panel realize and know that how grave uh, this uh, diabetic foot issue is and you know a very impressive uh, healing recovery that you showed us uh, in your slides uh, and i'm of course we are going to continue doing more and more of these programs so that um, we can create a lot of awareness across the country uh, but we'll jump on to the next uh, speaker now and uh, we'll come back to you with a few questions uh, after uh, we have dr gunjan bajal with us and another very critically important topic uh, which is oncology and cancers as we know are on a rise um, is what we know and uh, fatality is because of cancer are also on a rise and uh, i don't know but dr gunjit bajal can actually uh, tell us more if there is really a rise in these cancers the complications and and in that case what are the most important things that uh, patients should be keeping in mind and early detections and more uh, dr gunjit bajal uh, you really want to know all these uh, inputs from you a very critical topic you are going to address Uh, thank you a very good afternoon to everyone uh, i am dr gunjan and i would like to at the onset thank uh, true wealth for this opportunity to share my thoughts uh, after two very uh, you know good talks by dr rufino and dr mahendra uh, i am left with a you know a mountain of a task to meet their uh, oratory caliber but uh, i will not be using slides because i want to convey certain important messages which i believe are very easy to be picked up by people so uh, obviously at the onset i will give you an introduction as to basically what is a cancer a cancer is uh, when the cells of the body are rendered into uncontrollable growth so this is a cancer so what are we trying to do when we are trying to treat the cancer is we are trying to control the growth of the cell and reverse or reduce the number of cells so why is it important in the context of geriatric people so obviously we know that cancer is a disease which can occur at any point in time in our lives from the pediatric age group to the geriatric age group but of importance is that this cancer problem becomes most important or the maximum number of patients that we see as clinicians are those who are stepping into the geriatric age group that is the most common incidence of cancer begins once you cross the age of 50 increases into the 60s and 70s 
so this brings me to the point that what is what are the most important risk factors and in fact the most important risk factor for cancer is age so as you are growing and as you are aging the cells are also aging which we call cellular senescence and as the cellular senescence uh, you know as we age so the ability of the cell to somewhat you know uh, replicate or the damage that happens in the dna of the cells does not get repaired and sometimes the cell loses its ability to die that is the normal process of repair is lost and that gives rise to the cancer tumors and the growths in various parts of the body and cancer as a terminology is not a single term there are several different types of cancers depending on which tissue loses that ability to die and uh, continues to replicate so those are the things that we need to understand and uh, you know diagnose the various different cancers so that is the most important risk factor of cancer and that is the geriatric age group so one of the misconceptions that people have is that uh, if we are very old and we've got cancer we should not take too much of treatment well let me bust the myth myth the myth is that most of the people getting diagnosed with cancer are aged the most of the people who are surviving are the ones who are taking treatment at that age and are uh, doing well so that is very important for all of us to understand what are the other risk factors that we see in commonly in our life the biggest risk factor that we are seeing in in our country as well as in the western world is tobacco tobacco related cancers form the biggest chunk of our practice that we see on a day to day basis in india this is mainly in the form of chewable tobacco that we see which gives rise to a large percentage of head and neck cancers which uh, are in the mouth that is the tongue the cheeks the posterior part that is in the tonsil the voice box these are the major forms of cancer that we see due to the use of chewable tobacco as well as smoked tobacco now in the western world a concept is coming into play that is the smokeless tobacco whereby people are using e cigarettes and other things to you know and feel more safer but very frankly speaking the data to say that this is safe or is safer than the smoked tobacco is very very less and since these things uh, cause cancer over a period of time whereby the usage is almost 15 years 20 years for a person to be able to judge the efficacy of these things with regards to the causation will only be known to us after 20 years so if you want to stay safe this is the major risk factor that is tobacco and along with that alcohol which one should stay away from when i say stay away from alcohol tobacco of course it's a total no no as much as less or not at all is probably the way to go when it comes to alcohol probably yes the people who are into binge drinking or drinking daily are the ones who are at maximal risk i will not say that you should not look at alcohol totally but no you should not be drinking on a uh, day to day basis apart from these uh, the other risk factors which one must control are obesity diabetes in fact in the women obesity and diabetes is a very very important cause for what is called as endometrial cancer endometrial cancer or the cancer of the uterus is very important with these two diseases so and that is why one must control breast cancer risk is increased due to a high body mass index in patients the other things are certain things like uh, healthy habits of uh, you know uh, uh, going for exercises doing daily you know routine for a workout a small workout is very important in trying to control these basic risk factors so if you understand tobacco alcohol a healthy uh, lifestyle is what you should be following the majorly the controllable risk factors are what you can control the other risk factors which are not in our control are of course which we inherit from our patients and uh, parents and that is genetics this is the biggest uncontrollable risk factor and even with this the risk of uh, developing a malignancy might be reduced if you are trying to at least control the controllable risk factors
because having a genetic mutation which puts you at risk does not mean it will always convert into cancer and genetic cancer which has now become a big buzzword uh, sorry to bust the myth again is only 5 to 7 percent of our practice 95 percent of those are sporadic cancers and those where the risk can be controlled so what is important is that we must try to diagnose these tumors early why do we diagnose these tumors early a because the number of treatment options available to patients who are in the early stage are higher b the burden of disease is lower the stages are lower and hence the possibility of your being able to cure and control these tumors are very very high at this stage so if you look at any cancer in the first or the second stage in most of the tumors the control rates over a period of five to seven years would be in the range of 80 to 90 or even more for some of the cancers but when you look at the same cancer which is diagnosed in the stage three or stage four the control rates are very dismal they are about 10 to 15 percent in many of the cancers so you can see the vast difference and why we must diagnose this cancer early because if you want to get a better outcome Secondly, thirdly, the functional outcomes of early stage disease when treated are better. So patients who are treated in the early stage, say for a buccal mucosa or oral cavity cancer, their gross outcomes or functional outcomes may be better. So for example, if a teacher is diagnosed with a stage 1 buccal mucosa cancer versus a teacher who is diagnosed with a stage 4 buccal mucosa cancer. For that person, to be able to stand in his class and to be able to do his job is a very important thing. So in the stage one, you have a smaller surgery which needs to be done, a smaller area which needs to be radiated. So you get a much better functional outcome. He is able to continue with his job much better than when he has a big disfiguring surgery or a big disfiguring, uh, you know, uh, radiation which needs to be given for him. And that is what is the impact where we see a lot of WhatsApp posts and uh, Facebook posts talking about side effects, this effect, that effect. The, the incidence of side effects is basically related to the volume of treatment. So if you come at the fag end of the disease where I have to give you a lot more treatment, you are going to land up with more side effects. It is the simple concept of fishing. Where do you dip your fishing rod? You dip your fishing rod in a place where you expect the density of the fish to be high. So at the end of the day, if you dip your head into treatment, when you are at a very advanced stage, you are definitely going to be at a higher risk of side effects for from these diseases. So that is where the uh, point needs to be understood that we will be uh, needing to diagnose it early. Fourthly, the important thing is the financial burden. Now just imagine a patient comes in the third stage where he has to be treated with a surgery, he has to be given radiation, he has to be given chemotherapy, he has to be given immunotherapy. Cost is huge in lakhs versus a person who comes in the first stage where he needs a small surgery and a small amount of radiation. The treatment is over in under a lakh. This second person in the early stage is functionally more capable of going back to his job and earning bread for his family. So he retrieves the money. Whereas a person in stage 4 is spending a large part of his life which is left coming to hospital and going back home in taking treatment. So you understand why this early diagnosis and treatment is important. It is not only important from the perspective of survival. It is important from the perspective of functional outcomes as well as the cost benefit ratio that treatment will be able to give it to you. So what are these cancers which you can diagnose early? Simple oral cavity cancers. If you see a non-healing ulcer which is not going for 15-20 days with normal treatment, please go and visit an oncologist and check if this needs a biopsy and you need to confirm that this is a cancer because these are very treatable and very very curable in the early stages there is no need of being afraid of going for treatment for such a thing a simple thing if you are a chronic smoker once in a while just get a low dose ct scan to check if you have got a lung ca 
there are guideline requirements for these patients who can visit the oncologist or a pulmonologist and get these scans done for them and they are easily available in most parts of the country now a breast uh, ca once the female crosses the age of 40 or 50 should get a mammography done for herself at once a year or i recommend it even once in two years is okay for women at low risks so these are simple tests for men who are uh, having uh, the risk of prostate cancer after the age of 50 all you need to do is a simple blood test which costs you 500 to 800 rupees once a year that is the psa test just go to an oncologist for a routine uh, general cancer workup exam at least the common cancers will be able to screen and if we are able to diagnose them early we are easily able to treat these patients and give you a much better quality of life and functional outcomes so these are the basic early signs if you are having a non-healing ulcer in the mouth or in the head and neck area anywhere which you need if your voice is hoarse and you are not able to speak clearly for a pretty long time of maybe 15 20 days once a month in spite of antibiotics and treatment for laryngitis you need to look at voice box cancers lung cancers will not give you early symptoms you need to be prepared to search them from an investigative perspective if you are having any digestive troubles whereby difficulty in swallowing or small amount of abdominal pain once in a while don't neglect these symptoms if they persist if any symptom in the body if there's a lump in the body anywhere which you are seeing is was maybe 0.5 centimeter 1 centimeter a few days ago and now has increased slightly in size or has become more firmer you need to go visit the oncologist to check if your urine you are having continuous problems uh, in passing urine recently i saw a patient like this who has been having this problem for more than a year or so and he's just been visiting and getting endoscopies done when all he needed was a psa test and we were able to diagnose him with a curable prostate ca so now he's on his way of cure so these are the basic things that you need to do to understand the impact of the disease and if you are aged please don't be fearful of treatments because nowadays the treatments with regards to uh, surgery we have got a lot of non-invasive techniques with regards to radiation there are a lot of radiation fractionations and treatments which have come on better machine called linear accelerators whereby we can do a very short course of treatment the where the side effects are much less compared to what we used to see earlier uh, days when we did not have those machines with regards to chemotherapy we generally toggle and titrate the dose of the chemotherapy in, based on your body weight your age and other things and there are some lot of other agents which have come into the picture which can increase your life and have a different or a more tolerable side effect profile so that is why my message to you is basically be aware be clear and yet don't be scared because as physicians we are also trying to help you so come to us when we can do the maximum for you and i am sure you will be happy with the results because we have got a huge number of patients now who have done well who are surviving and are really doing well and as i finish my uh, talk here i am waiting to go on to another meeting uh, where there are around 500 cancer survivors waiting for me to talk to them so that's what i am trying to convey to you early diagnosis treatment will lead to not only good survival it also has economic implications and functional implications so with that i will end my talk here thank you so much uh, dr baijal i uh, thank you so much for actually really talking about the scare and the worry part uh, of of this disease and getting treatment treatment is what uh, the patients are more worried about and um, i mean uh, it's commendable that you're going to talk to another 500 of your patients and cancer survivors um, we assure you that you know your talk to, to us also is going to reach uh, many people and we'll continue taking a message to more and more people uh, in the future as well um, so if you could wait on uh, or come back for the questions uh, we'd yeah. be happy uh, yeah but, i am uh, there i am there so just keep my questions for the end i'll just finish sure. off there sure of course of course
Thank you. Um, uh, and now we actually come to the last talk uh, before I speak a little bit of nu nutrition is of course the most, uh, I consider it to be a very critical, very sticky issue, which is, which is the kidney care. And um, very few of us really know uh, whether these diseases are reversible, uh, if they are reversible, what has to be done? And uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Amol Mahaldar, uh, you, you have a uh, Herculean but I'm, uh, task at hand every day. And uh, today out here, I'm sure you're going to simplify it a little bit more though for our patients so that uh, they worry less and, and they actually work towards uh, kidney care along with uh, uh, you treating them. So uh, what do you really do? Thank you, thank you, Ms. Gargil, and thanks to True Wealth for uh, giving this opportunity. Uh, yes, I'll try and to uh, make it simple and keep it brief as well. So we'll talk about what are the basic facts of, uh, of kidney issues in older people, what are the causes, what are the simple symptoms that they come with, how we diagnose, how we treat, and what is to be done to prevent. So first, what are the kidneys? The kidneys are actually the waste uh, generation or the waste elimination organs from the body. Whatever we eat and uh, we digest, uh, some of it goes from the intestine, but a lot of it is being absorbed and is being utilized for creating energy and building blocks, which are the proteins in the body. When this has to be eliminated from our body, it is going out in the form of urine. So blood comes to the kidney with the waste products, gets clean and goes back. So it acts like a filter and what is not required is being thrown out in the urine in the form of water in the urine as well as various nitrogenous pro uh, products. But this, although sounding simple and just one function is associated with so many functions and so many different other hormones that it will be too many to enumerate. But just to give a brief idea, even the production of blood in the body requires a hormone which actually is activated in the kidney. The vitamin D, which is so essential for the bone health, is also being produced and activated in the kidney. Uh, Dr. Rufino spoke so elaborately about blood pressure, and we know that the heart is the one that actually controls the blood pressure in the body. But you will be surprised to know that the kidney is actually the gauge which decides what should be the blood pressure. So whether it should be 140, 90, or 160, 100, or 130, 80, which is normal, uh, the kidney is going to be either a cause of this disturbance or is going to get badly affected by this disturbance. So as we age, the kidneys also age. After the age of around 40, we lose around 1% of kidney function every year. So that means if we are going to live for around 100 years, so after the age of 40, we are going to lose 60% of our kidney function at the age of 100. But even that is enough for us. So kidney has a lot of reserve function. It's only when the kidney loses more than 30% uh, of its function, or balance is only 30, that patients come with symptoms. So what are the common problems that affect the kidney? One is what we call as chronic kidney disease. And then there are a the number of other problems which are because of the kidney uh, and the excretory system, the ureters and the bladder which cause secondary problems in the kidney, like the prostate, urinary tract infection, electrolyte night disturbance. We'll touch only a little bit of cancer because Dr. Gunjan spoke so well about it and a little few words about stone disease as well. So what is this chronic kidney disease? Chronic kidney disease is something that is going to slowly destroy your kidney. Like I said, the kidney has a large reserve. So when it loses kidney function less than 60 ml per minute. Now, normal kidney function is 120, 90 to 120 ml per minute. When this becomes less than 60 ml per minute, we call it as chronic kidney stage three. Patients who have protein loss, even with normal kidney function, we call it them as chronic kidney stage one or two, depending on what is their kidney function. So the symptoms of this problem come very late. Patients who actually report to the doctor with symptoms like uh, breathlessness, of an easy fatigability, or <clears throat> altered smell of their breath because it contains of ammonia, loss of appetite, they almost never get reduced urine, and that is quite, quite counterintuitive. Now we think that kidney is making urine, 
so it it will the dysfunction will come up as reduced urine contrary to that initially they get lot of urine at night they get nocturia and later on they get foamy urine means lot of froth in the urine because of protein losses some of them come with difficulty in urination absolutely reduced urine or no urine is a very late manifestation of kidney problems and by then it is quite late and what are the causes of this chronic kidney disease more than 60% of that is uncontrolled diabetes the other few uh, 30 40% odd is because of heart disease causing kidney problems because of high blood pressure affecting the kidney because of obesity tobacco and so many other issues that can affect the kidney so how do we diagnose this kidney problem like i said very few patients will actually come to us with symptoms and early so it is only by screening test that you can diagnose the kidney problems at a very early stage and the screening test is actually not very complicated a simple test of the urine called as urine albumin estimation tells us whether a person has some protein loss in the urine so this test is recommended for all diabetic people every 6 months so that will tell us whether they have kidney disease onset at a very early stage and then the diabetes doctor himself or the your general practice doctor himself will be able to take certain may changes in your medicines which will protect the kidney another test which we do which is also simple is just the blood test called as serum creatinine estimation from that serum creatinine we can then find out what is the kidney function by a formula nowadays all the labs actually give this test along with that result of kidney function we call it as estimated gfr don't be alarmed by what is the number on that because sometimes a low number and a patient who doesn't have protein loss is better than a higher number with protein loss so you need to discuss that with your diabetologist or your physician he will be able to educate you what that number means for you so it is very important for every senior person to know what is his kidney count a simple word we use to that call that is a kidney count one other test that is recommended especially in the older people is a ultrasound even for a small reason even if there is a suspicion we should do an ultrasound in these people because very often they might be harboring some asymptomatic kidney problems either a stone or some obstruction or some cancer and try diagnosing that at the early stage will help us treat it uh, the triple d in the same style as writing rrr actually means you need to alter your diet if you don't want to take the drugs and you need to take your drugs and diet seriously if you don't want to reach the stage of dialysis that's how it goes a diet for a kidney patient simply is less salt or half salt not zero salt Uh, let me repeat that less or half salt not zero salt and no salt substitutes as well because salt substitutes are made from potassium which is also not good for the kidney lot of water to drink again the kidney works less to make more urine so if you are drinking a lot of water the kidney is working less is less stressed the rest of it is all what is good for your heart low uh, you know less uh, fried stuff less red meats avoid sugary stuffs a, a full diabetic diet uh, dr gunjan touched very beautifully upon alcohol you know you, you we have to say that you have no reason to start drinking for health so although there are some studies which show alcohol is protective there is no reason to start drinking for better health if somebody is already having alcohol he needs to curtail it to only one or two drinks in a week that's what is healthy drinking smoking is an absolute no for the kidney for the lung for every kind of cancer so those would be the important things this i already touched upon you know your diet has to be this pyramid where you eat a lot of fruits and vegetables you will eat less and less of uh, processed food uh, colas chips and other things all hope is not lost in case of somebody being a patient with kidney disease because we can delay the progression from ckd stage 3 to 4 to 5 taking the medicines properly will reduce the progression at which they will reach the end stage of kidney disease and even those who reach the end stage of kidney disease still there is hope in the form of dialysis or transplant 
and dialysis can also be you know for older patients uh, of a type called as peritoneal dialysis which can be done at home itself of course the standard hemodialysis is there which is to be done in the hospital and uh, although the super senior people who are more than 70 or 75 are not good candidates for a kidney transplant people between the age of 60 to 70 are still served better by going for a kidney transplant than continuing to be on dialysis what do you do for better kidney health? So these are some nine simple things. One is take care of your sugars and keep them as normal as possible. Take your blood pressure seriously and you take all measures to take, keep your blood pressure in control. Maintain a good healthy intake of fluids, at least around uh, two to two and a half liters per day. Maintain a healthy balanced diet. By that I mean seriously a balanced diet, a little of everything and not too much of anything. Food, fads are not a good idea. Reduce your salt intake by half. An important point is to not take these over-the-counter pills for pain especially. You know, sometimes going to the uh, orthopedic doctor in time for your knee pain will save your kidney. Because if you go on taking those pain, pain pills and for delaying your knee surgery, you could end up with no knees and no kidneys. And then these patients are very difficult to treat at that stage. Like I've said before, smoking is not good for your heart, lungs, and kidney. And most importantly is to go for the screening test of the urine and the blood, especially for five groups of people. One is if you are diabetic. Two is if you have had any heart, uh, any uh, uh, high blood pressure in the past. Three is if you've had kidney issues in the past. Four is if you are overweight. And five is if there is family history of kidney disease. So these four or five groups of people should get a kidney evaluation or a screening done by that simple blood and urine test and then maybe repeat it every six months or a year. What are the other problems that can cause kidney problems where kidney becomes a silent victim? Mainly in men, especially it is prostatic enlargement, which is not a cancer, but just a benign enlargement of the prostate, which you can see here blocks the urinary pathway and causes back pressure changes in the kidney. So if you undergo treatment for this in time, sometimes it is just a tablet, sometimes it is a simple surgery, an endoscopic surgery. If you undergo treatment for this in time, you will save the kidney from total shutdown in the future. In women also, we get what is called as recurrent UTI. It's because of the shorter urethra in women. And treating this in time is very important because uh, neglecting it for a long time can cause kidney failure. But let me just put a disclaimer here that you should not be over-treating it. Many times now we are seeing patients do a urine exam and come to us with a, with a report which says pus cells in urine and they want us to prescribe antibiotics. That is not a wise thing. You, the doctor needs to make an assessment whether you genuinely have a symptomatic urine infection and then he could treat with antibiotics. Otherwise, you could avoid them. But healthy habits like properly cleaning from front to back, uh, emptying your bladder frequently and not holding on urine for a long time, uh, using clean toilet spaces and avoiding public toilets and things, simple measures like this can avoid repeat urine infections. Some of the other problems of older people are a little peculiar and come because of certain reasons. One is electrolyte disturbance. Some older people get this hyponatremia because they consume a lot of water and less salt. So that's why I was saying not no salt. You have to have what is adequate salt. And when you say lot, uh, have a lot of water, it's not more than three, four liters of water. It's around two to two and a half liters. Because if you don't and you take too much water and too less salt, you could end up with hyponatremia. Some patients are on multitude of medicines and that can cause high potassium, which is called as hyperkalemia. Some patients are on diuretics and other medicines which make them lose potassium and that hypokalemia. So uh, older people need to be aware of these things. Uh, like I said, uh, sometimes uh, you know, obstruction of the kidney might be a problem. One is prostate. Second is in the bladder. The cancers also can affect the same places. Cancer of the prostate can be there. Cancer of the bladder and ureters. Sometimes it may be a secondary problem because cancer of the cervix or some other abdominal organ is blocking the passage and then causes a obstructive kidney problem. 
cancers of the kidney can also happen and sometimes the kidney get damaged because of chemotherapy so like dr gunjan said if you come in time and we can give you the correct chemotherapy or a lesser chemotherapy it might save you from kidney troubles stones and infections are the other problems we see stones at all ages even in the elderly people in elderly people we see what is called as the bladder stones quite a bit sometimes because these stones get neglected they get damped and you know there is a lot of urine that stays behind patient comes with urosepsis to us uh, i already explained to you about this low urinary tract infection problems and the judicious use of antibiotics i think i'll close there uh, and my request would be that older people should screen themselves for this kidney ailments by those simple tests of blood and urine thank you and i think we can go for questions sure so uh, um a very extensive yet simple talk from you uh, uh, and you know i think a lot of uh, in information uh, which you know uh, will will really help uh, the patients understand uh, that they're having kidney issues and also there is a fear factor there as well but i have couple of questions i know we have uh less time but uh, uh i'm going to quickly uh, uh jump into a few inputs on in terms of nutrition and diet for geriatrics again a very important area uh, for people to understand because this is the time when people don't feel like eating uh, and that is when the nutrition loss or the nutrient loss really happens so uh quickly i'm just going to um, cover a few important points and then we can Uh, get into some questions as well uh, so nutrition really um, is extremely vast a topic when it comes to geriatrics but let's focus on what really the nutrition should address and uh, i'll first go over the first important thing i think in geriatric patients is energy and muscle because sarcopenia of course uh, we all will agree is sets in and when uh, especially when there are cancers it becomes even more difficult but more more or less more importantly uh i always like to show the slide and uh, can we really deny him when he says everything is energy especially in case of uh, the older patients uh activity loss happens and that also is extremely critical when there is when they are, they are low on energy low on nutrition um just instead of doing just diet they really need to also focus on nutrition so uh what do uh, we all talk about proteins and uh, uh dr amol magar you will of course agree that you know kidney patients need protein but at the same time you know it is uh, one thing you have to keep them devoid of so how do we intelligently sort of uh, add protein into their diets is uh, yeah it is a quite a difficult area but uh, you know we have to manage that and why really proteins because proteins are also a good source of energy uh, but uh, to address sarcopenia Uh, proteins are essential to keep the muscle and keep the strength in the uh, elderly is extremely important but not just that um, proteins are also when they break down into amino acids they are actually providing uh, the precursors for manufacturing enzymes hormones and antibodies in our body so you know when it comes to digestion when it comes to various different critical processes where enzymes are needed in the body proteins are important and a uh, lot has been said about uh, about immunity and anti antibodies uh, through the pandemic but uh, this is another very important area because no matter if it's uti or if it is um, uh, oncology or if it is any other ailment where they are getting admitted the uh, immuno competence needs to be in place so that's why proteins are important and how do we really safeguard our Uh, organs or our kidneys rather when we are taking these proteins focus on proteins uh, uh, such that the source is good so that uh, the essential amino acids are uh, uh, you get the essential amino acids out of it instead of loading uh, protein for gaining muscle so that's something which you have to uh, which has to be focused on uh, there are of course various sources of proteins but it is important to actually get protein from these various sources um, uh, balancing it uh, as you age non vegetarian dairy and and of course uh, uh, the vegetable vegetarian sources all these uh, vegetarian in the sense legumes uh, uh, 
um, uh, is uh, nuts. These are the ones who really need to balance out. Balancing is actually the uh, key in these cases. Uh, so, you know, there could be intolerance to a dairy there. Uh, we have to also do the tightrope walking there as well. But make sure that the proteins get digested so that um, uh, while they go out, while they are thrown out of your body, it does not exert pressure um, on uh, on your digestive system as well as your kidneys. So that's critical. Along with it, a proper mix of uh, vitamins and minerals is essential. Uh, uh, just taking standalone, very high uh, um, uh, uh, dose of vitamins is not enough. Synergistic effect of vitamins and minerals is critical. And uh, for this uh, deeper knowledge about uh, this is uh, essential when you are actually, when we actually advise your vitamins and minerals to the uh, patients. And uh, they are very critical for also the uptake of nutrients, apart from the fact that it's needed for immunity, calcium up uptake, and so many other such things. So uh, critical uh, when it's in, in geriatric patients because the nutrient loss should not happen and they can get most of the nutritious foods. So really focusing on digestion, enzymes, and mood is really what uh, and I should also look at and for that um, I highly recommend uh, enzyme supplementation for the geriatric patients uh, because I've seen a lot of good effects uh, uh, because of it um, you name the disease and uh, it is actually essential uh, to have enzymes may it be uh, diabetes may it be uh, CKD may it be um, cancers uh, and enzyme supplementation is definitely going to uh, help the patients. Um, and of course, uh, it will uh, enhance the nutrient uptake. Uh, for, for the same, even if you're not doing supplementation, there are various uh, fruits like pineapple, papayas, which you can consume uh, on a, on a uh, regular basis, but also consuming half raw vegetables, which becomes a little difficult in the, the elderly because uh, they might be losing teeth and uh, the dental care is not uh, as good. But having said that, which is why supplementation in these kind of situations uh, is good. Keeping your mood good, uh, food actually impacts your mood in a good and bad way. So if, if you're eating right, your mood can get better. And that way the vicious cycle of mood and food can uh, stay in tandem. And we all know about the gut and brain axis because because of which mood and mood both gets impacted. Uh, this is extremely important uh, in case of uh, the elderly because mood and having a, a good mental uh, relaxed uh, of living can actually enhance uh, their, uh, uh, their conditions, whatever they're suffering from, or can actually prevent any diseases they, that they would, um, they would get. Having said that, the third important aspect I feel um, nutrition and nutrition plans should focus on is on lowering inflammation. Now, lower, why lower inflammation? Because first, let's quickly understand what is oxidative stress and chronic inflammation. Simple example to give you here is uh, so uh, here if you see it's a simple diagram. Uh, when we get hurt by a simple pin, our inflammation, inflammation is the process uh, that occurs in our body. It's, it's our body's protective response against infection, injury, and more. And it is a complex cellular process involving various types of immune cells, clotting proteins, and signaling molecules. This, kind, this process is actually good, really, for you. But if this continuously goes on and on at a cellular level in our body, it can actually create bad effects. Um, oxidative stress, on the other hand, is something what happens to an apple can happen to the cells in our body. These two processes uh, coexist and exist uh, all over our body for a long time. This can actually be a risk factor for a cardiac disease and um, uh, diabetes and so many other, uh, of course, the metabolic syndrome, but uh, so many other uh, auto inflammatory uh, diseases as well. So look at it. I mean, every organ can actually be affected by uh, the inflammation and oxidative stress.
stress. So while while we recommend to our patients that they they've got to have a balanced diet uh, in terms of carbohydrates, proteins, fats, and hydration and oils. At the same time, there needs to be a balance in the alkaline and the acidic foods that we eat. So um, this slide, as it says, our stomach pH is two to three point five, and this acidity is necessary to break down the food. But at the same time, um, human blood is always slightly alkaline, the pH of seven point three six to seven point four four. So blood pH can lower out of the normal range due to ketoacidosis caused by diabetes, starvation, alcohol consumption. And this balance, that's why between the alkaline and acidic foods is essential uh, to keep the stomach acidity and the blood uh, alkalinity uh, in tandem. So what we eat is really critical because that's uh, what causes, can cause or aggravate these issues. The acidic foods uh, do include the proteins that we eat. So bear in mind that when we are uh, increasing the protein in our uh, intake, we also have to balance it out with uh, neutral foods like starches, natural fats. So we, when while we are also trying to curb eating less starches, less fries, less wheat, we have to have a balance between all of this. And uh, that's why uh, what Dr. Amul also mentioned is that you know eating fruits and vegetables. We all know it has to be done, but it has to be followed regularly. And that's really what uh, we do in our practice is go after the patients and make sure that they are compliant when they're eating. Fruits are great sources of antioxidants. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sure Dr. Montero will agree on that because these are again very important for heart health. And um, if uh, uh, the other uh, aspect where inflammation can also affect uh, is in our joint health and pain and inflammation uh, in the joints. So, there can be several supplementations that could be taken, but a good balance in the alkaline and acid diets can also help your um, keeping pain at bay in case of uh, genetic patients is a difficult task because especially when you are suffering from uh, renal issues, uh, CKD, you are you or any other uh, lifestyle diseases. Post 65, you're advised not to take too many painkillers and that's where you need to resort to certain natural pain feeders, which can be gotten through foods or through supplements. And there are so many of these uh, uh, nutritional supplements and herbs that can be consumed to keep uh, inflammation and pain at bay. Hydration is extremely important. Having that electrolyte balance uh, that Dr. Amol mentioned, it's not no salt. Also, you need to take care of your potassium. So having a tandem uh, in the electrolytes is important. At the same time, uh, if there is a uh, if there is something wrong going on with your electrolyte balance these days, there are so many lab tests which can be conducted and make sure that uh, you have a tandem there. Also, very important when you have to keep your body hydrated. So, drinking water uh, regularly, judiciously is important. If you are of course suffering from um, uh, kidney issues, you have to make sure how much water you have to drink, less or more both can actually be an issue. So having a critical balance of fats, of course, you have to have to make sure no trans fats, um, added sugars have to be avoided, processed foods have to be avoided, and sodium has to be gotten under control. So this goes without saying for the elderly. And another very important, um, uh, I would say a nutrient or a uh, important nutrient or an important supplement that you can consume, which of course, uh, people from Goa need not really worry about it is consume a lot of fish, but yet omega-3 fatty acids are very important because you can see here that they can reduce inflammation, uh, they can actually increase vasodilation, reduce uh, platelet aggregation. So when it comes to cardiac health um, it, or heart health, the, uh, the omega-3s are important. Um, there are different types of omega 3 omega-6, and uh, this that itself in itself is a big presentation, but, you know, consuming these different uh, fishes, you know, also walnuts, um, eating chia seeds these days, which are, which are pretty much in vogue, uh, eating almonds, uh, these are important. Also, nuts um, and vegetables in different seeds. So if 
if you can consume those, uh, it's critical. And then, of course, uh, last not the least, fitness versus exercise. You have to stay fit. The idea is not to exercise too much, but to do a light to moderate activity every day. Uh, overall, body and mind exercise every day. Uh, reduce the time that you spend actually sitting or lying down because this is what a lot of old people do. Uh, reduce that time period and keep balancing it with activity. Uh, if you're really fearing that you, you'll fall or you've had a fall, then in that case, you need to do exercises. Otherwise, also, you need to do exercises to improve or keep your strength, balance, and flexibility going. So um, these are some inputs from uh, my end. And uh, um, here are a few questions that actually um, uh, we have received. And I think I can, uh, the first question really is for Dr. Montero. Um, there are quite a few which have come, but I'm going to restrict uh, it to a couple of questions for today. Um, Dr. Montero, one of the patients here, here is asking is, can I stop my diabetes medication if my HbA1c has dropped from 8 to 6.5? Because I'm just plain and simply suffering from diabetes. Well, if the HbA1c has come to 6.5, it is because of the medications. So they can't stop the medications. He has to be in touch with his doctor who will maybe modify the certain medications, but the patient on himself or herself cannot stop the medications. It has to be only maybe a modification, but not a total stoppage of the medications. And then, of course, diet and exercise are very, very important. That is the backbone cornerstone of diabetic therapy. If diet and exercise is not there, then medicines will just mount and mount and mount and there won't be a real good control of the diabetes. Uh, so, Dr. Dr. Kulchak, uh, uh, one uh, important question uh, I feel I want to ask on my side is that, you know, um, a lot of us know that when it's diabetic food, uh, we're either visiting a diabetologist or we are probably going to a surgeon. Uh, how critical is an orthopedician's role here and, you know, uh, how critical is the whole integrative uh, uh, treatment and the role of uh, doctors to integrate their uh, approach uh, towards the patient? I think uh, the task that we have right now is to create protocols for every patient with diabetes walking into the hospital. Every patient walking into the hospital has to go through a, a team approach. It cannot be that the patient visits a physician, gets his uh, prescription for a metformin and goes home or he has a kidney disease, he meets a urologist or a nephrologist and goes home. This patient has to be evaluated by a, uh, a counselor or a basic MBBS doctor who knows, uh, is like a traffic police who will assess the patient in a whole, look at it right from his head to the toe and look at all the risk factors. As I said, the stratification of all the risk factors and then guide that patient to go to the discipline. The orthopedic surgeon's role is, 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 is something that is comes much, much later. Once these deformities are identified, the ulcer has already formed, then the surgeon comes into it. But I think it's more important that the physicians themselves are aware that which patient should go where. So if, if uh, you know, if a, tomorrow a patient walks into Dr. Rufino's clinic, he should be able to tell pinpoint that uh, even if you don't have an ulcer, in six months you will have a chance of getting an ulcer. That will only happen when his patient, every patient needs to be assessed for a foot problem. And diabetes, uh, you know, the first thing that lands on the ground is your foot. So every patient with diabetes will have some or the other issue in the foot. So once we start educating our uh, physicians or treating doctors to think in a more uh, multidisciplinary team approach way, then we are going to pick up all those lesions early and able to treat them. Frankly, as an orthopedic surgeon, the surgeries that we do on these patients are so uh, you know, nothing rocket science. I mean, I do much, much more complex surgeries. But, you know, those simple surgeries make a huge difference. The outcomes that you see are so, I mean, within a matter of weeks, it looks like magic what you have done. So you just have to assist the body's ability to heal and remove those, uh, you know, those uh, speed breakers that are preventing that wound from healing. So I think, uh, Dr. Montero, would you like to add to this? Because, you know, 
how important is it to uh, manage your diabetes uh, while you know you are getting treated for uh, these uh, uh, ulcers? I didn't get you. How important is it to actually manage the diabetes in itself? You know, while while these ulcers are being treated, the way uh, Doctor Kushtar uh, right, just showed right, us. Rightly, as Doctor Mahindra said, whether it is before the ulcers formed, during the ulcers, and even after the ulcers are treated, the management for uh, diabetes is very of great importance. You have to see that the diabetes is under good control. Without that, first and foremost, patients' peripheral vascular disease or peripheral neuropathy is going to keep on uh, worsening. With that, there will be ulcer formation. If the diabetes is not treated, the surgery is not going to have any good effect. There will be secondary infections. There will be worsening uh, peripheral vascular disease or peripheral neuropathy. So treatment of diabetes is of control of the blood sugar is of utmost importance along with control of lipids, stopping cessation of smoking, avoiding alcohol, seeing that proper diet is maintained, and on the whole, the fluid and water balance, fluid and electrolyte balance, seeing for the kidney function. This is all a complex thing. Diabetes encompasses all the systems. So everything has to be looked at. And it is the physician who is like the director of the orchestra. And he will then see which of the components of the orchestra is going to play at what time. Uh, whether it is the orthopedician who will come in, whether it is the nephrologist who will have to step in, whether it is the cardiologist who will have to do an uh, uh, angio or uh, intervention. So all these things are of great importance of the physician being the master or the choir master and the other members of the choir pitching in with the music. Oh, that explains it well uh, that you're the orchestra master here. So uh, I think uh, patients uh, would understand whom to reach out to first. And um, uh, greatly so the way uh, Dr. Kuchakar is adding his uh, uh, skills to uh, treating these patients and actually creating protocols for uh, treating diabetic food. Um, having said that, uh, uh, you know, uh, just as Dr. Montero said that, you know, when the hb one c is coming down, it's because of the medication. And then, you know, that means the medication is really reversing or uh, controlling the disease. So, Dr. Maldar, what, what is the situation when it comes to CKD? And um, because, you know, can medications really reverse the disease when it comes yeah. to CKD? Yeah, so, when it comes to CKD, the thing is you can't really reverse the disease. You know, very few patients we diagnose in the very early stage where the GFR is normal and they are just leaking protein. And then with very tight sugar, blood pressure control and certain medicines, we can stop the protein loss. And actually that can reverse the problem. But most patients will come to us with already low GFR, below 60. At that stage, we can't really reverse the disease. What we can do is slow down the progression. Like I said, normally also, people start losing 1% kidney function every year after the age of around 40. Diabetic patients start losing kidney function at 10% every year. So they progress much faster. Very well-controlled diabetic patients will lose 2-4% to every year. They will lose more than the normal people, but much lesser than the uncontrolled ones. So what we can do there is to reduce the rate at which the kidney function is declining. Many times you can't really make it normal. Yeah. Uh, one more word is about this uh, person who asked the question about improved sugars. You know, sometimes it's a paradoxical thing that sugars yeah. are better, but that's because the kidney function has suddenly got worse and the small number of medicines he's taking is enough to bring the sugar down. Sometimes it goes hypo also. So he'll need to actually go and consult his, like the master orchestra man to find out what is the status of the kidney. Uh, even if the medicines have to be reduced, they have to be done in a stepwise manner. You can't just suddenly stop. Well, that, that was good to know because uh, that's a worry factor and that's why people 
need to realize that kidneys are such critical organs that we better take care of. Uh, a, a related question again to Dr. Uh, uh, Gunjan Baijal here. Actually, we, we all spoke about how diabetes can affect the kidneys, the diabetic port, and, and uh, uh, the cardiac health. At the same time, does, does uh, diabetes or the metabolic syndrome interfere when you're actually treating your um, cancer patients? And, you know, does it also then affect the chemotherapy versus the uh, inf infection risk? You know, how do we really also weigh down this risk? See, diabetes is a comorbidity uh, for an oncologist. And if it is an uncontrolled diabetes with end organ dysfunction, at that point in time, first of all, because of that end organ dysfunction, we need to assess how much of treatment we will be able to give. For example, if the patient has an uh, end stage renal disease or uh, CKD chronic kidney disease due to diabetes, we need to assess uh, how much of uh, is the clear creatinine clearance based on which uh, the dose of some chemotherapies might have to be modified or we may not be able to give certain important uh, drugs. For example, if a patient has an uncontrolled diabetes uh, in a setting of a surgery, at that point in time, we may have to defer surgery or accept the risk of poor wound healing uh, at the end of the day uh, for this patient or post-operative infections if uh, urgent surgery is required. Similarly, coming to radiation, for that matter of fact, uh, if you have an uncontrolled uh, diabetes, you may get worse skin reactions or worse uh, mucositis during the treatment. So these are the basic things that we look at uh, when we are handling a patient with uh, diabetes, uh, uncontrolled diabetes. However, if your diabetes is well in control, no end organ dysfunction, very frankly, I really would not be even looking at the diabetic status of a patient to decide on my treatment. So in that sense, yes, whenever patients have comorbidities, what we do look at is controlled comorbidities versus uncontrolled comorbidities. So if the controlled comorbidities are there, then it really may not affect our decision making by very much. Vis-a-vis -vis an uncontrolled comorbidity, which may lead us to take certain decisions in the interest of the patient and compromise on certain specific aspects of care. And um, if you could add a little bit more about, you know, uh, the worry between chemo chemotherapy and infections, because, you know, uh, if that's the case, you know, going See, to again, a facility... Again, again that's, what, that's what I said, that at the end of the day, uh, infections in a diabetic patient is important so before you start on to chemotherapy you will be making sure that the patient is regularly taking his diabetic medicines or is put on to insulin so that the sugars don't spike or fall or lead to that rise in infection but yes if you are a diabetic patient whose diabetes is uncontrolled then definitely yes your infection risk is higher and uh, we have a complication in the realms of chemotherapy, which is called febrile neutropenia. Uh, diabetic yeah. patients are known to have more severe form of this complication, which can even lead to ICU admissions and a pretty turbulent course to recovery. So in that sense, yes, controlled controlling the diabetes is important. What message I want to con convey here is that just because you are diabetic, does not mean that your oncological treatment needs to be compromised or changed as long as you are focused on controlled controlling the diabetes and keeping the diabetes in control at least for the duration of the treatment for the benefit of the disease as well as your oncologist and after your treatment control is finished then keep it in still in control for your own personal benefit so that is the idea. So uh, the 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 question I wanted to add ahead of this was, you know, then going to uh, does it also matter when it comes when it comes to infections? And this question, uh, even uh, the other doctors can answer, but but mainly you, uh, it, does it matter going to a facility which is more equipped, and you know, especially going to a place like Goa where you know which is a little bit less busier visa more visa vis the super metros. 
uh, is it a better idea to get treated uh, uh, treating your cancers in uh, a place like Goa and a center like yours? I am sure uh, that I will vouch for the fact that yes, do come to our hospital and get treated. Uh, we are doing quite a good job and a decent job with regards to infection control as well as other things. But yes, to a certain extent, it uh, probably does uh, make a difference in having uh, you know certain facilities in an, in areas where you can control the infections. But at the same time, infection control more than a matter of you know the uh, of the place. It is more a matter of your own personal hygiene. So if you are able to maintain uh, a good personal hygiene at your house in say Delhi for that matter of fact or Bombay for that matter of fact and have a safe mode of transport from hospital to home and other things relocating yourself to a different city for treatment might be difficult because you don't have the comfort of your house and that was the whole inception from the inception in this country there have been three or four centers uh, in the metropolitan cities which have taken the lead role with regards to oncological man ma management and they that continues still that they, they are very big centers but at the end of the day that is where the revolution started that patients should not move from their own place of residence because it is more comfortable and easier to manage such a long duration of treatment and that is why tier b and tier c cities got uh, equipment and doctors like myself moved out from the comfort of our own states and our own uh, you know residences and moved to these places to try and give those uh, people who did not have facilities good facilities and now to ask the metropolitan people to come to us for treatment i think we are trying to reverse the uh, you know cycle in the same direction as previously so the comforts of your house is the best place to do your treatment you need to make that house more hygienic you need to keep the protocols in place well i think uh, on that thought uh, uh, where dr bajal mentioned that you moved out of your uh, comfort zones and you are doing a lot for the patient each and uh, each of you over is here today you know you are taking so much additional effort for your patients and the therapies that you're giving uh, hats off for whatever the work that you are doing here. Uh, it, it has really been in a very, uh, you know, satisfying uh, experience for me itself to, uh, to have you all here and, uh, you know, the inputs that you, have, you all have given, I'm sure it's going to help so many people watching it. Uh, we from our, our end are going to make a promise that we're going to reach this program to maximum number of people that we can. Uh, having said that, I would uh, want each of you to just leave us with your final and closing remarks. Uh, should we start the reverse? I think we can start with Dr. Vigil itself the other way around. Uh, once again, I will just give you, leave you with the uh, simple line of one poem which I like and has been my support system in the, my times of trials and uh, tribulations. This poem is by Rudyard Kipling. It's called If and I'll read the last verse for you. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue or walk with kings nor lose the common touch. If neither force nor loving friends can hurt you. If all men count with you but none too much. If you can fill the unforgiving minute and this is important with 60 seconds worth of distance run. Yours is the earth and everything that's in it and which is more. You'll be a man, my son. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bajal. That was wonderful. Uh, I think we'll have Dr. Amol Maldar after that. He's smiling already. Uh, you're muted. You'll just. Yeah, I'll unmute myself and rather than quote a shairi or a poem like Gunjan, I'll just get straight on with the job. Half your salt, double your water intake, control your weight and sugars, have a balanced diet. Avoid pain medicines which are unnecessary and get yourself screened by simple blood and urine tests. That's that's the thought, basically. Sure. And then we have Dr. Mahendra Kutsarkar. Hi. Uh, I think, uh, you know, being aware of the problem is half the battle won. And once you're aware of it, uh, 
setting up the right protocols, directing the patient to the right uh, person uh, so that the patient gets a comprehensive care and um, advising the patient again and again and counseling them from time to time is a very important part which is almost neglected in our treatment making them aware of what are the consequences you know these things are not emphasized during the treatment or even if they are you know it really doesn't make an impact on the patient so i think that will make a a huge difference in where we have a separate counseling a counseling station where the patient is it's really ingrained about how to take care of the feet how to take care of the footwear how to take care of the sugar what are the spree also lesions they have to look for and the entire family needs to be educated on this so i think that will go uh, education i think is the key and organizing ourselves in a very uh, disciplined and multi team approach will take make a long way to uh, achieve what we want to achieve yeah so your love and i think we uh, we have a very long way to go with our awareness programs here <laughs> but uh, final word to the boss uh, dr rupino montero and we'll close the session with his closing remarks yeah they say that old people deserve a medal a medal of existence which crowns their long term victory against the cruelty of time and the dangers of this chaotic universe and growing old is humbling and it takes effort to accomplish this stage of life with dignity to make an elderly person happy is the noblest act a young person can ever do so i think all of us would be really doing noble deeds to do our best in taking medical care to this old people and seeing that they live with dignity and they die honorably that is the most important thing because many a times you can't do much at a certain stage and point in their life so just the twilight years living in dignity and going away peacefully with happy memories to all the near and dear ones is i think the most important therapy we can do so with that i would say thank you god bless thank you all of you for actually coming here taking out time out of your really busy schedules on a sunday and uh, contributing uh, towards creating more awareness in each of uh, these care areas for the elderly patients thank you and we close the session by playing a short video of uh, energia which keeps uh, the energia team keeps supporting us in actually taking the programs uh, forward uh, thank you to the energia team once again uh,